there. All right, well, let's, uh, let's go ahead and get started. And uh, we're going to be in Matthew chapter 6 tonight. Matthew chapter 6, I'll give you just a second to turn there with me. And tonight we're going to look uh, at the next section of the Sermon on the Mount. We've been studying our way through the Sermon on the Mount. And uh, last week we ended in Matthew 6, 8. Tonight we're going to look at the next section of it where Jesus has sort of transitioned into talking about prayer. If you recall from last week, he was telling his disciples that when they uh, went to pray, that they should not stand out on the street corner and blow a horn and ring a bell and all these things that the Pharisees did to, to gather attention before they prayed. But instead they should go into a secret place and they should talk to God because that's the purpose of prayer anyway is to talk to God, not to put on a show. And so they should go into a secret place and they should pray to God and God who's there with them in that secret place and God who sees everything in that secret place, uh, God who even knows the condition of their hearts in that secret place will reward them openly. So he, he transitioned into talking about prayer and then he begins to explain to them how they ought to pray. And there were, there were other occasions where his disciples asked him, teach us to pray. And, and he led them through what we call the Lord's Prayer. Now, I assume they called it the Lord's Prayer because it's the Lord that gave it to us, but it wasn't really Jesus' prayer because there are some things in here, like asking for forgiveness, that Jesus had no need of doing, right? Jesus was perfect. Jesus is sinless. So there was no need for Jesus to pray for forgiveness. We see other things that Jesus prayed, uh, in particular uh, around John 17, where uh, Jesus prayed for himself going into the crucifixion. Uh, Jesus prayed for us. He prayed uh, for us to be in him as he is in the Father, and he prayed for us to be one. And um, There were a lot of things Jesus prayed on his own and for himself. This prayer was given by Jesus as a model for the disciples. So I've heard some people call it the disciples' prayer. It's not really something, the, the name is not really something we need to get hung up on. But it is important to know this was a, a prayer that Jesus gave to them and to us as a model. Now, a couple of other things we need to pay attention to here. We need to be careful how we use this prayer. Uh, one, of the, uh, one, of the, one of the things I was looking at this week with this pointed out the irony of Jesus telling them not to go through vain repetition there in Matthew 6-7. Uh, we looked at that last week. He told the disciples not to pray with vain repetition like the pagans who thought that if, if they could get just the right combination of words, if they could get just the right uh, arrangement of words, if they could say it enough times, kind of like a mantra, that if they did that, then, then suddenly God would be obligated to them. He'd listen to them. He'd answer. It was almost like a magic spell they were casting by repeating these words. And Jesus said, don't. When you come to God, don't just jabber things uh, randomly. Don't just jabber things without uh, the heart meaning those things. He said the pagans think they're going to be heard because of their much speaking. Don't do like that. And he said that right before he, he gave this model prayer. This is where I was talking about the irony that I read about. The irony of saying don't do vain repetition right before introducing this prayer that in a lot of places is prayed as a vain repetition. Now there's nothing wrong with you praying the words of this prayer if you mean them from your heart, but how many times have we heard them recited? How many times have we heard these words recited just out of habit or just from rote memorization? Y'all are gonna think I'm weird and I've told you before I was a weird little kid but I grew up in church, and I remember after I learned this prayer, a couple of us had a contest to see who could recite it the fastest. You never know what kids are going to repeat after. Is there anything prayerful about that? Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. You're trying to spit it out like that. No, it's just vain repetition. So we want to be careful that we don't use this as something with vain repetition. But Jesus said, in this manner, therefore, pray. Okay? He gave this as a model. You can use these words, but it's really more instructions that Jesus took. And some of the things that, that our flesh wants to do as we pray, Jesus with this prayer took those 
and turned them on their head. Um, one of those things is to glorify the self instead of God. The Pharisees like to pray and attract an audience so everybody could see how righteous they were. Well, you can't really do that when you're praying this prayer and meaning it. And, um, and also trying to obligate God to our will, trying to bring God in line with our will. Well, if you're praying this prayer and you're meaning it, the opposite is going to happen. You can't pray this prayer in a meaningful way uh, or pray these principles in a meaningful way and do it with the intention of obligating God or uh, bringing God in, in line with your will. No, if you pray these principles, your, the object of your prayer is to bring yourself in line with God's will. So Jesus took everything that we in the flesh like to do to misuse prayer, and with this model prayer, he turned it all on its head. And this is what he said, starting in verse 9. In this manner, therefore, pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. All right. I don't know if we'll get beyond that tonight. I suspect we won't, so I'm going to stop there. And if we go a little further, then I'll read the, the next part then. This prayer. I have preached multiple week sermon series over this prayer and still felt like I just scratched the surface. Tonight we're going to go through the whole thing, so it really is just a crash course in the Lord's Prayer. You, you, those of you who are here in person, I, I have no doubt you've heard numerous sermons on the Lord's Prayer, and so this may just be a refresher for you. Uh, if you're new to this, it may just be an introduction to you, but we're going to have a quick crash course in, in what Jesus was telling them. So he told them to start off the prayer, our Father, actually... It may not even necessarily be the case that these things are to be taken uh, strictly in this order, but they have to come in some order. So in our prayer, Jesus told us that to pray something like this, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Holy. Hall hallowed is an older English word for holy. So we, in our prayers, should take the time to praise God for his holiness. We should take time to recognize God for who he is. You know, our prayer should, should look like this. It's okay, we'll see later on in this prayer, it's okay to pray for stuff, it's okay to ask God for things, but I find the more I pray and the more serious I get about prayer, the less time I spend asking for things. Now, I, I may, I, I'll ask for things I need, don't, don't get me wrong. I may even occasionally ask God for things that I want, but I, I realize we, we a lot of times equate prayer with I've got my want list and I'm going to take it to God. The more serious we get about prayer and the more time we spend connecting with God in the way that we're supposed to, the less of that prayer, the more time we're going to spend praying, the less of that time is going to be asking for things. And sometimes I'll find myself charging into prayer, into a prayer, because something's come up and I need God to do something and I'll jump in. And I'll say, Lord, could you please, and I even did this this morning, Lord, could you please, wait a minute. That's not the right way to do this. I, I need you to take care of this. You know what the need is, and I'll get to talking about it in a minute. But you've done so much for me, even today, and I've got so much to be thankful for, even, even today, even specific to today. Can Let me stop and back up. And just spend some time talking to you about what you've already done and thanking you for that. And there's there's got to be an element in our prayer of honoring God for who he is. Because we're not just coming to God um, to get stuff. We're coming to God to draw closer to him. And part of that is acknowledging him for who he is. Our Father in heaven. Hey, sometimes people describe prayer as talking to the man upstairs. I hate that. I hate that. Um, I'm not saying I hate you if you say that. I'm just saying that. I, I hate that. I, that bothers me as much as it did when I was uh, going to OU and I saw people wearing shirts that said, Jesus is my homeboy. All right. 
I appreciate that you're talking about Jesus on campus. I, I get that, but something about that shirt bothers me. He is the God of all creation. He's the God who sits enthroned in heaven, and we need to remember that. We need to remember his power and his might. We need to remember who he is. But even, even as we look at the, the might and the majesty and the power of God, we could easily, in that sense of reverence, go to an extreme in putting God up here, distant from us, and yet not only is he in heaven, but he's also our Father in heaven. So there's this tension here that we've got to find the balance in between about reverencing him as the God of this whole universe and paying him the appropriate respect, but also realizing that he has given us the right and the privilege of addressing him as our Father. And so he's, he's a being to whom we owe the utmost respect, and yet he still wants us to come close to him. And, and that's a tough balance to find, but that's, that's part of the, the adventure of getting to know God in a deeper way. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. So we come to God acknowledging who he is. He says, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. When we are praying this or when we are praying something like this, we are submitting ourselves to God. And Jesus was the model of this. Even though he's God himself, he's God in human flesh, he's the second person of the Trinity, he's equal to the Father in every way, he still, when he was here on earth, said, Father, here's my preference, but not my will be done, but yours. And this is where we need to come down in prayer. It's okay to ask God for things. But we also need to be to the point where we can say, God, I have my preference in this. God, I have this desire. You know what's on my heart. You know what I really want, so I might as well be honest about it. But at the same time, God, I really want what you want. And so I'm going to tell you, I'm going to be honest with you about this preference, but I'm going to pray your will be done. I, and we're looking, we're, we're submitting ourselves when we're praying for his kingdom to come and his will to be done we are praying in expectation of his will being accomplished and being obeyed here on earth the same way it is in heaven. Well, how is his will obeyed in heaven? He says it, and the angels snap to it. As a matter of fact, his, his will and his command are so mighty that he spoke the universe into existence. Think about this. I, I can't even... I can't even speak to this chair over here and make it move. God spoke to where there wasn't a chair. All right, God spoke to, God didn't speak to the universe. There was nothing. God spoke to nothing and it became something. That's how powerful God is. I think that's incredible. And we are praying and we are longing for a day, and that's what we're praying for, when God's will is obeyed here the same way it is there. When God speaks and everything snaps to attention. And in our prayers, one of the things we need to pray for is for that to happen, not just here on earth, but here in me. You see, I, I pointed out one of the things that Jesus took and turned to be opposite in our prayer life is that a lot of times we have this idea that we need to pray so that we can bring God in line with our will. We might not phrase it exactly like that, but we can, if I pray, if I say just the right words, I can get God to do what I want God to do. No, we're not praying for God to do our will. We're praying that we would do his will. And over the years, I've found I'm not, I'm not perfect at this. I'm not perfect at any of this. I'm just telling you some, some things God's word says and some things I've learned. But over the years, I found myself praying less God, would you do this for me? Would you change this situation? And more, God, would you use this situation to change me to who you want me to be? That is a hard thing to pray. That is an uncomfortable thing to pray. That is not what my flesh wants to pray all the time. And yet I find God incredibly willing to answer that prayer. God, bring me into line with your will down here, just like your will is done up there. Any, any questions or comments so far? I'll pause there for just a second. Now they're kind of sitting there going, but I already know this. <laughs> well, it's, it is a good refresher. And I really like the way you really emphasize the first part of that. Our Father who art in heaven. He's the Father. We're the children. We serve Him. He does not serve us. 
Yes. And young Christian people that have not come to know the Lord Jesus Christ always, in times of distress, cry to the Father and not realizing, well, wait a minute, where were you at when everything was good and he took care of everything? Right. You know, that you get that. So what you're saying is the very first part of that, stressing that he is the Father. Mm -hmm. And then from nothing he created everything is so vitally important because when we come to, to the Father in our prayer with the mindset that he is God and what he can do, it changes our prayer totally. That's right. It, like you said, all will has to become his will then because that's all Christianity is, is surrendering. Mm -hmm. We surrender ourselves to Christ to be saved. We surrender each day to his will. We surrender ourselves in prayer. And yes, it's okay in prayer that, like you said, ask for the things that we desire from our heart. And when we do that, maybe the answer is no. Maybe our heart's wrong, but it allows God to show us a direction because prayer is not one way, it's two ways. God will speak to us. Yeah. For those who probably weren't able to hear that, Brother Greg made a comment about I made several comments there, and I may not be able to re restate all of them, for, but uh, said a few things about prayer being a conversation and uh, made a good point, I think, about uh, just the reminder that we serve God, not that he serves us. And, uh, you were talking about how I emphasized the first part of this as you were talking, and I, I, was, I always hate to say, well, you were talking about this, I was thinking such and such, because it makes it sound like I wasn't listening. I was. As you were talking, though, the thought popped into my head um, you know I told you early on that I don't know that Jesus necessarily meant you have to pray all these things in chronological order like these are steps the thought prop the thought popped into my head when you mentioned my emphasis on the first part well I probably need to emphasize the first part the first parts are the hardest what I mean by that is it's harder to come with that right attitude it's harder to pray to submit than it is later on to pray God help me out in this situation and so maybe maybe Jesus didn't arrange this as a chronological oh you're supposed to do these things in this order but Jesus hit with the hard punches first about what was going to be more difficult for us to to do uh, but you're but you're right I think that's a good way to summarize it we we do need to be reminded uh, I need to be reminded that we serve him and not the other way around. Uh, I think this prayer, you know, I think if we're praying along the lines of this prayer, it, it makes it harder to forget that. So. Jesus himself in the garden, said, let this cup pass from me, but your will not mine. Absolutely. Let this cup pass from me. If there's any other way, because he knew what was coming, right? That's what we need to say. Yeah. Your will not mine. That's right. He, he knew what was coming on the cross. He knew what he was there for. And he, he didn't, I mean, it, that doesn't sound like anything anybody would look forward to. So he said, Father, if there's any other way to do this, if there's any plan B, let this cup pass from me. But, yeah, he, he came back and said, but I'm willing to do it if, that's, if it's your will. Yeah, we, that's, that's a hard place to get to sometimes, isn't it? We have to wrestle with that will of ours and bring it into line with God's. All right, in verse 11, he says, Give us this day our daily bread. Hey, that's, that's fairly easy. Out of all these things, that's fairly easy to ask God for. Give me the stuff I need. Take care of me. And yet actually relying on him to do it is not something that necessarily comes naturally for us, and that's why we need to pray for it. Give us this day our daily bread. Because we get to a point where we think it's all dependent on us, don't we? We get to a point where we think we're we're in charge here. It's easy to ask God for stuff. It's a lot harder to recognize our our actual dependence on it on Him. And this reminds me of a, a prayer request I read today from one of our missionaries in Zimbabwe, and they were talking about how God has provided money for for the work that they're doing, and the money continues to come in for this particular ministry that they've got going. But he said it's never. Um, it's never so little money coming in 
that we're tempted to compromise or do things the wrong way. But he said it's never so much that we get so comfortable that we feel like we, that, that we're tempted to forget about him. He said it's always just enough and just in the right time for God to take care of that need so we continually remember our dependence on him. So even asking for the needs, he's not telling us, pray for everything you're ever going to need the whole rest of your life. He said, pray for your daily bread. Ask God and depend on God daily to provide exactly what you need. Get to that point where you trust God day by day, where you're not having to hoard it. Just like, just like I, when I read this, I think of the Israelites and how they were told to gather manna in the wilderness. And they were told other than the eve of the Sabbath, they were not supposed to gather more than they could eat in a day. And if they did, it would stink. It would go bad. Uh, instead, they were told, you've got to trust God that the next day that manna is going to be there. Because our human nature, is, it, may, it may not be there tomorrow, so I'm going to gather up all I can. No, no. You trust God. Don't trust the manna. Don't trust the money. Don't trust this or that. Trust God to supply your daily needs. That's hard. It's easy, like I said, it's easy to ask for. But it's hard to get ourselves to that point of, of recognizing our need. And forgive us our debts, verse 12, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Forgive us of the places where we fall short as we forgive those who fall short as well. Now this is a little difficult to pray as well. Not only is it difficult to pray to help us be forgiving. We've had some Wednesday night conversations about forgiveness and when should I forgive and what does forgiveness mean and, and we've had to talk around that because forgiveness can be hard. And our, our flesh doesn't always want to forgive, does it? It's hard enough getting to the point where we realize, God, I need to be able to forgive this person. I may not want to, but I know I need to, so help me to forgive them. I think it's even harder sometimes saying forgive me because we don't want to admit that we've been wrong. That I think is why the cross is so offensive to so many people. I think that's I think that's what the barrier is with a lot of people to the gospel is to get that forgiveness you've got to admit you were wrong. To to get that grace you've got to you've got to bow the knee and acknowledge that you've sinned and we don't we don't like to do that. If 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 you think I'm wrong, not that any of you are acting like you think I'm wrong, but if anybody thinks I'm wrong on this, go up to somebody in the middle, and next time you're at Walmart, walk up to somebody six feet from them, all right, and look at them and make sure you point and say, you are a sinner. Is that going to work out well for you? No, we don't like to be told we're sinners. We don't like to be in the wrong we don't like to be accused. We don't like to be guilty. I've got children who are growing up to be little politicians, I'm afraid, because they will, <laughs> they will spin the, the facts and they will argue every which way to prove they were not the one in the wrong. All right? they, nobody taught them how to do that. It's human nature. We don't want to be wrong. And yet we've got, there, there's an element here where Jesus is telling us to be humble, to come to the Father asking for that forgiveness. Do you know what? He forgives those who are repentant. And we've got this idea of repentance being, oh, I've got to get my life cleaned up. That's not what repentance means. The Greek word means a change of mind. I think the fact that we come to that point of being willing to ask for the forgiveness, be, be willing to acknowledge our need for that forgiveness, is, is repentance in and of itself. And God forgives those who repent, but those who are repentant of, of their sins also become willing to forgive others. It becomes really hard for me to hold things against other people that they've done to me when I realize what I've done to God and what he's forgiven me of. I mean, think about that. How many times has our Heavenly Father forgiven you? beyond what we can count. High numbers, high digits, and yet somebody does something wrong to me once or twice, and I find it hard to let that go. Now, Jesus is calling us to be repentant, to 
humble ourselves and be willing to ask God's forgiveness, but also be willing to extend that forgiveness with God's help. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Now, I think we've got to take these together. Because I don't believe God does lead us into temptation. As a matter of fact, the Bible says when we're tempted, we shouldn't say, I'm tempted by God. God does test us. God does allow us to be tried at times, but to, to tempt us with evil, the Bible says he never does that. God never tempts us with evil. God's not going to lead us into temptation. As a matter of fact, the Bible says God will make a way of escape from the temptation. So we don't look at this one piece at a time and say, oh, if Jesus is saying we're supposed to pray for God not to lead us into temptation, that must mean God can lead us into temptation. That's not what he's saying. When you look at both of these statements together, do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. It's not saying... God, I'm worried that you might lead me into temptation. It's saying, God, please lead me the absolute other direction. Don't let me walk one step closer to it. Lead me, the, lead me all the way out. Lead me directly the other way. Do not pass go. Do not collect $200. <laughs> Turn me around and head me back the other way. Okay? Because we need his help to do that. Because not only are we not strong enough sometimes to avoid the temptation, we're also not smart enough. I, I'm not sure. Um, well, we just can't see everything coming down the road at us that Satan's got planned. He's crafty. You realize that? He's sneaky. The Bible talks about the wiles of the devil. We need to be delivered from the evil one because I hate to say it, but he's smarter than we are. But God's smarter than he is. And so Jesus told us to pray that we would not be led into temptation. We need to pray every day for God to help us to avoid the temptations, to avoid the pitfalls that lead us astray. And instead, for us to walk in the Spirit and follow His Spirit, and for His Spirit to lead us and guide us down the right paths, avoiding all the pitfalls, just lead us all the way away from them. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And I think this is just the bookend to the prayer where we start out with God's glory and we finish with God's glory so we understand that all of this everything we're doing is to God's glory and for God's will and for God's honor and not for our own I could start on the next section but I'm not sure how long it would take me and we do still need to do our, our prayer time so I'm gonna leave it off there and say I understand that that may have been an inadequate summary but that's all it was intended to be tonight was a summary because there's so much material here. Like I said, I've done entire sermon series on the, uh, on the Lord's Prayer. Tonight was just a, uh, a refresher and just a general summary. But do you have any questions or any more comments on that latter half? again surrendering that's that's kind of the theme of all of it yeah. and uh, and that phrase you know that phrase lead us not into temptation has troubled me and that's why I spent some time explaining it tonight um, instead of looking at it as a as a request because you're worried God might do the opposite we could look at it as an as an expression of our confidence in God that he is going to lead us uh, away from temptation anything else if I could see that far away I'd ask our television audience if they had any questions but I can't I, I, we've got messages popping up over here but I can't I can't read them all right well before we sign off uh, to take prayer requests I do want to share one prayer request with you from the International Mission Board of the Southern Baptist Convention we pray for one of these every Wednesday night and this is for the Sanufo people of Mali in West Africa. 
Uh, we had to edit it down a little bit for space, but you'll still get the, the general idea. And uh, when we have our prayer time tonight, I'll ask whoever leads us in prayer to also remember our missionaries in Mali and the field there. It says it's heartbreaking to see so many people who are in bondage because they have accepted Satan's lies. They fear other beings instead of fearing God and devote themselves to idols, denying God the worship and honor that only he deserves. We haven't seen many professions of faith during our time here, but we know the power of the gospel and will continue to proclaim it. We know that only God can and will change the minds and hearts of the lost. So ask him to open the eyes of those who are blinded and deceived by lies so they can comprehend how wonderful this good news is. Pray for more Sanufo people to let go of false teachings that they've held all their lives so they can be released from fear and bondage and boldly choose to believe the truth of the Bible and place their faith in Christ.